Wow, what a powerful time. I mean, I, I get to meet and talk with Josh and Matthew and Luann and Stu and others here at the lot behind the scenes. And what I love about this team is there's such a, it's just such this deep desire for the Loft family to experience the presence of God. It's, it, it reminds me of, um, I don't know, you guys, it reminds me of Psalm 23 where the Lord is a shepherd and just brings his people to the river. And I just feel like this team does such a good job of bringing us to the river. Um, I've come and been able to be a part of some of these weekends as we've been online and I, I find myself resting in God's presence. Whether it's this new song that Josh is singing, singing over me, I'm just like, man, God, you are singing over us as a people, or it's just this belief that God has brought us out of Egypt and all that looks different in our own lives. But regardless, I'm so just thankful for this team. I know, I know Rob, we miss you, but I also know you're crazy proud of what God is doing here at Loft and Loft family. We miss you so much. I know this team misses you so much, and we can't wait uh, to be back in the same space together. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mark Swayze, and I'm the pastor of Student Ministries. I can't believe I'm saying that still. Like, it's wild to me to be able to say that. And I've spent the last 10 uh, weeks, I'm sorry, not weeks, 10 months working with students and working with Rebel Base staff, and um, it's been such a joy for me. It really has. Um, I don't think I could have ever predicted that I was gonna move in this direction but I don't think the calling of God is ever really predictable. I, I don't think it's something where you sort of know, oh yeah, this is what my life's gonna look like five years from now. This is what my life's gonna look like 20 years from now. This is what my life, no. The calling of God is always uh, steady for him, but for us, it's this wrestling match where we're just trying to figure out, God, how do I live into the purposes of my life in the midst of questions and decisions that I have to make? And that's why I'm excited about being with you now is we're gonna continue in Galatians, but we're gonna look specifically at Paul and his understanding of his calling and the value and importance of us as the people of God to understand our calling, our purpose, the reason we were created. What does it look like, God? What is my calling? And I hope what you'll do is leave today going God, what is it stirring on the inside of me that I'm called to with my life? Maybe you're in a living room with your family right now. If you are, make sure someone grabs a Bible and flip over to Galatians. Um, we're in this series, and Josh has done an unbelievable job these first two weeks. It's, it's called Free for All, the Unrestricted Gospel. And basically, we're walking through the letter of Galatians and talking really about, I mean, Josh, the first week talked about the Galatians is one of the most influential and powerful books that it paints for us the primacy of one thing, that is faith in Christ is all that we need. In other words, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That the, that the gospel that Paul was preaching to the church of Galatians was a gospel that was simple, that all you had to do is place your faith in Christ and that alone led to salvation. Paul was a, a missionary called by God. He would go throughout missionary journeys, one, two, three at a time. It was during his second missionary journey that he actually went through the region of Galatia. And through that region, he planted a bunch of churches. And so when we see letter to the Galatians, we're seeing a letter to a region called Galatia. And these churches were filled with Gentiles and unbelievers, but they were also filled with Jewish people. And Josh talked about this on week one, but we call them Judaizers, and they, they get sort of a bad rap. Uh, but they were people, they were Jewish people that were in these new communities that said, all right, so the gospel is faith in Christ alone, got it. Shouldn't we probably observe some of the law? <laughs> Shouldn't we probably stay circumcised and make other people be circumcised according to Moses? Shouldn't we follow certain food restrictions? Shouldn't we do a better job of maybe following some of the ceremonies and not cut out everything, Paul? But Paul, in response, wrote this letter and says, no, anything that you add is not the gospel. The gospel is simply that easy. It is faith in Christ leads to salvation. It is justification by faith. That's why Galatians is seen as the, uh, 
the battle cry of the Reformation. Martin Luther grabbed a hold of it because he constantly has to remind the church and we constantly have to remind ourselves that what God is looking for is not our faith and then a bunch of works, but God is looking for faith. And Josh led us so powerfully that on week one. Week two, he talked about the love of a father. I I wish I had a little kid. I don't have a little kid. That was the cutest thing when Elsie came on the stage. Um, But I am reminded, I mean, even as we were singing that song, Singing Over Me, I I remember singing over Lauren the first time we had her in the house. I remember thinking, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to be a dad at all. And I, I remember putting her in the crib that first night, and I remember singing over her. I still remember the song. It was... Baby, I love you more. Baby, I love you more than I have ever loved before. That was my natural song the first night with my daughter. When you have a child, your heart expands and you begin to love more than you thought possible. And then you begin to go, wait, how is it possible that then God says, you're my child? That's mind blowing. And Josh painted the picture that we've been adopted, that he's our heavenly father and he loves us so much for God so loved the world. And what we're talking about tonight is we're talking about Paul's calling because those Judaizers, they begin to say, Paul, wait a second. Are you sure you're right? How are you so sure that you have the right gospel and it's not us that has the right gospel? And what Paul does in chapter one, and go ahead and flip to chapter one, verse 11, what Paul goes ahead and does in chapter one is he says this, here's how I know this is the gospel. It's because no human gave it to me, but God gave it to me. God is the origin of the gospel for me. God is the one who spoke to me this revelation. And so when I speak it to you, I'm not speaking from James or from Peter in Jerusalem. I'm not speaking a good sermon that I heard about Jesus. I'm speaking the very revelation of God in regards to Christ. And this revelation is this. I have been called to share the simple gospel with you. Now, wait, Paul, how how do you know? And what Paul does is he lays out for us how he knows. He anchors his ministry in this gospel in his calling. His calling was the foundation from which he moved forward in his ministry. This calling was such an anchor for him, for his soul, that he was willing to die for it. That's what callings do. They are the undercurrent. They are the anchor They are the foundation of the believer that says, I just don't think God's calling to me, calling me to something. I know God's calling me to something. And when you know God's calling you to something, nothing stops it. As terrifying it is to stand on the stage, as terrifying as it is to lead worship, as terrifying it is to be a teacher at school, as terrifying it is to stay home with all your kids, you just know on the inside of you, God's called me to this. And even though it doesn't always make sense, I will die for it. We experienced some of that, but for Paul, he literally died for it. He writes in Galatians chapter one, verse 13, and I'm gonna read verse 13 through 15. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous of the traditions of my father. Paul's saying, hey, I was an up and coming Pharisee. If there's anybody that could add to the law, I knew the law. I lived in legalism. I was next in line to run the thing. I was moving my way up. And then verse 15 blows my mind. He says, but when God... Just stop and breathe for a minute. But when God, all of us have that moment, a but when God moment, when we were living a life, our own purpose, our own desires, what we wanted, what we longed for, what we wished for, but when God interrupted our story. Verse 15, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, the Greek charis, kindness, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Acts chapter nine describes that revelation when like a light out of heaven on a road to Damascus, Paul is blinded by the risen Christ in a supernatural encounter. That was the revelation he speaks of here. 
so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. What Paul is saying is, listen, this is the anchor of Paul's calling. Number one, I was formed by God. Not I was just here on the earth and then God showed up. No, God was actually a part of my formation. Yes, 30 years later, I finally am understanding what is happening. In fact, I lived most of my life not understanding, but God was there at the very beginning forming me for this purpose. That's powerful. Number one, I was formed in the womb by God. Number two, I encountered Jesus. I had an encounter with Christ. And that encounter changed the trajectory of my life. And I, three, was given an assignment. And here's Paul's assignment. His assignment was to preach to the Gentiles, to non-Jews. Was it the same assignment to Peter? No, Peter was called to preach to the Jews. Was it the same assignment as me? No. Was it the same assignment as you? Was the same sign as anybody in the room? No, Paul was given a specific assignment that was made for him. Now listen, this is anchor for the soul of a calling. God formed you from the very birth, from the very conception. He formed you in your mother's womb. At some point, you had an encounter with Christ that changed everything for you. You understood for the first time that even in your brokenness, even in your sin, God still loved you. It says that he pulled you out of, he called you. He called you out of darkness, 1 Peter 2, 9. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You had an encounter with Christ. And then three, he gave you a specific assignment. That was the foundation of Paul's calling, was that simple belief. Now, you and I wrestle because we're not, I'm not Paul. I, I've never been struck on the road to anything. I've never had to been blinded and had to have people pray for me. I've never heard the actual voice of God say, Swayze, this is what you're called to. So I'm sort of wrestling with the scripture this morning and going, well, great for you, Paul, but that's not my story. Here's my story. I went to college at Baylor and I got a phone call from someone, a friend of mine that said, hey, you wanna come to San Antonio and help me start the service? And Missy and I are like, I don't know what we're supposed to do with our lives. And we prayed about it and we, we weren't sure, but we just kind of felt like, yeah. So we went. For nine years, we were in San Antonio and I loved every second of it. It was awesome. Then I got a phone call from the youth director here, Bob Swan, who called and said, hey, Swayze, you guys wanna to move to the woodlands? I thought, no, I really don't. But then we came to this church and um, I knew Josh and Josh was coming to this church and I thought this could be really cool. And so we just felt like, yeah, I think we'll come. And we came here and we've been here for six years and it's been amazing. Two years ago, I started feeling like, man, I feel like I'm supposed to do more of a pastoral thing. And I didn't know. It's not like God spoke from the heavens. I just sort of felt like something's going, something's shifting on the inside of me. And so I began to wrestle through that. And I went to Israel with Dr. Robin Sorensen. And all of a sudden there was this moment on Mount Nebo. It wasn't God's voice, but it was just this sort of reaffirmation. Okay, I'm going the right direction. And then I got a phone call from uh, someone here at the church said, hey, would you consider being the pastor of student ministries? And I thought, I, that wasn't the plan. Uh, maybe, let me pray and discern. And we, Missy and I kind of got, my wife and I got together and we just thought, and then this, is, this feels right. See, my calling and maybe your calling is not as simple as Paul's. But some of the truth still remains. See, you and I make decisions every day. You got to decide where you go to, went to college. You got to decide where you're going to college. You get to decide what your career is gonna be. You get to decide who you're gonna marry and what kind of job you're gonna have and what neighborhood you're gonna move into and what city you're gonna stay in and what church you're gonna be a part of, this loft community. You got to be a part of those decisions. And I've got to be a part of decisions over my whole life. But what I can't get over is that all of my decisions that I've made in my life have been a wrestling match with God where I've said, here are my decisions, but the undercurrent of all those decisions is this deep longing to live with purpose. And so for us, when we talk about calling, I wish we could say that it was just this one day, but when God, and then all of a sudden I know what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life, but hear this today, church. Your calling is not a destination. It's a process. 
It's not you finally get to it and you go, oh, now I know why I was created because I still haven't figured it out. I'm just in student ministry trying to be faithful to what God's called me to and, and wrestling with God and going, God, is this it? And at the same time, knowing that my calling is not gonna be a day where I land at the result, but it's gonna be this process of trusting in Christ. What's your calling? What's your deep down desire? What has God planted in your heart that no one can convince you otherwise? What is it you long for, think about, dream about? What is that on the inside of you? And could it be that in all the decisions you're making in your life and the decisions you're gonna make over the rest of this year and in 2021 and 2022, all the decisions, what is that undercurrent underneath all of that? What is that, that thing that God has created you in your mother's womb for? What is that thing when you encounter Christ that you sense there's something more with my life? And what is it on the inside of you that you long to be a part of? What is it on the inside of you where you go, maybe that's my assignment? There's really three things I want us to ponder about today. Number one, this one's tough for me, by the way. I'm just gonna say before I say. Number one, your life is the story in which you're neither the author nor the main character. Your life is a story in which you're neither the author nor the main character. You didn't create you, God created you. Your identity is not your title at work. Your identity is not your annual compensation. Your identity is that you are, Ephesians 2.10, the, the handiwork of God. God's very creation. You didn't write your story. You didn't write the table of contents. You don't know the table of contents. You didn't write chapter one. You don't remember chapter one. Yet God does, and God knows it. You're not the main character. Life doesn't revolve around you. It's not about figuring out what's best for you. Man, it's taken me a long time to figure that out. If God's the author of our story, then we have to make Jesus the main character. Jesus is the main character. That's why Jesus says, or Paul writes this, is that what part we and I get to play is the ministry of reconciliation, as if God is speaking to the world through us, that we are ambassadors of Christ. And I've spent so much of my life trying to be the main character. Man, I've looked up to people and thought, man, I just wanna be like them. And if I could be like them, then, then man, I'll fit into the calling and desires of my heart and um, I'm sure Josh and Matthew can say this. I've always looked up to worship leaders and pastors and thought, man, if I could just be them, if I could talk like them, if I could sing like them, if I could write like them, then I could be what I wanna be. And so I step into the role of both author and main character. I write my story. Here's how I get to that. I become the main character. I'm the one on the platform. I'm the one that has this great ministry. And I've wrestled with that forever. I'll never forget um, I always looked up to Chris Tomlin. I know he was here at the church and we've, I've gotten to meet him several times. Josh and I and Matt got to meet him last year. And um, there was this one time where um, I was invited to open for him in Tennessee at a conference and there was 10,000 people. It was crazy. And I remember thinking, this is all I've ever wanted to share the stage with this guy. And um, I got to lead three or four songs before the set um, and, uh, and then Chris played after me and it was awesome. I mean, it was great and kids sang and responded and I was up there and they were leading. It was so cool. And I just thought, man, this is awesome. And, but I remember going back to my hotel that night and sitting there and going, man, I thought that was gonna be more. I thought that was gonna be everything I ever wanted. And I just remember in that moment, God speaking to my heart and saying, I don't really need another Chris. I made you for something that's not his and not his path. And I've created him for something, but I've made you. Hey, if you're listening right now, God made you for a specific purpose. And what he doesn't need you to be is someone else. He needs you to be fully you. 
Church, be fully you. That's what we need. And we need each other. And if a room full of people live into just being them and go, I'm not the main character, Jesus is, and I'm not the author, and God is, and all of us in community together hold on to that truth, there's unstoppable momentum in loft because it's people living into who they were created to be. Number two, to discern our call requires an encounter with Christ. Yes, like Paul, maybe it's this one-time encounter that changes the trajectory of your life, and there's so many stories like that, but to discern our call, we need an encounter with Christ every day. Perhaps our calling is determined through that relationship. His name was Jose, and he was in Honduras, and we took 25 kids on a high school mission trip this past spring break, and it was awesome. In fact, I've done so many mission trips, but this was the craziest one I had ever been a part of. And here we are, we're in the middle of the week, and John Hole took us to the top of Tegucigalpa's dump heap. And we were there with all these high school students, and I was thinking, I don't know what we're gonna do up here, but we began to feed people and start singing and praying for with people. And I remember catching Jose's eye, and Jose didn't speak any English, but I had an interpreter. And so I went up to Jose and I said, man, you gotta tell me your story. I just, I can't stop. I can't, I just gotta know. And um, so we start talking and I had translators speaking and I'd speak and he'd speak and come to find out Jose walks four hours a day to get to this trash, deep, trash dump. He then picks up plastic bottles all day long in the sun and then he puts those plastic bottles in his backpack in a bag and carries them home four hours, eight hours round trip a day where he lives with his sister in a shack and that was his life every day. And he's been doing that since he's about eight or nine and he's now in his mid-20s. So he, that's all he knows is every day he wakes up at four, gets to the trash dump at eight, works until five, gets home around eight or nine every day. That's his life. So I said, Jose, man, what's, I, I don't I can't, just you gotta tell me about how, how do you do that? What do you do on your way there? And he goes, actually, it's really, really boring. Like I, 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 just, I just walk and I just try to, you know, I just try to think about things, but I don't know, I just really boring. So I was so curious, I said, Jose, do you, um, do you ever talk to God? Do you ever pray to God? Do you, do you know anything about God? Jose was quick to stop me, like, I'm gonna stop, like, no. He said, I'm not religious, and he used the word, I'm really dirty, and I just, I, I, don't, I don't know or would wanna know God. And I totally understand, I didn't wanna push it. And so we just kept talking, he talked about what he does and how he collects and I followed him and we laughed and we ate uh, lunch together on that trash dump. And trust me, it was so cool because all of us up there, we were there for hours, all of us up there forgot where we were. We just, just felt like we were among other incredible humans. So in the end of the conversation, I just said, Jose, I'm just gonna say this, but man, there's a God who loves you and I know you don't wanna hear it today, but there's a God who loves you and man, would love to walk with you every day here and back. So God bless you, love you. And literally as I'm turning, he stops me and goes, okay. It's like, okay, what? He's like, okay, I want him. So Jose on top of that trash dump received Christ. And he said, what do I do? I don't have a Bible, I don't have anything. I don't have any money. I said, just start talking to God on your way home today. I've wrestled since that moment because I think, God, is Jose right now in Honduras still walking to those trash dump every day? Is, is that the calling for Jose's life? Is that what you've created him? You knit him together in the womb for, was to walk every day to a trash dump. Is that it? And, and there's this moment where I just felt like God has stopped me and said that you're missing the point, Swayze. It's not what you do for God. It's what you do with God. That's your calling. It's not all these great things you do for God. It's that you do it with him. Perhaps that four hours to the trash dump and back is some of the greatest prayer, some of the greatest worship in the church. It's from a 28-year-old kid who's just walking to the trash dump, talking to his God and learning that his calling isn't about what he does for him, but what he does with him. Lastly, number three, your calling is now a future, is now 
Your calling is not a future event, but is now. Like I said earlier, our calling isn't this destination we sometime land at. It's what we have right now. And part of the way you and I discern our calling right now is to ask the question, God, where have you placed me? What's my career right now? What neighborhood do I live in? Maybe when Jesus said, love your neighbor, he meant literally love your neighbor. Like go and get to know and love your next door neighbor. What kids or spouses or family has he placed in your life? What friendship groups has he put in your life? What influence has he given you in your workplace or your career? Maybe part of your calling is not to try to figure out, okay, is this some grand scheme, but maybe in the midst of your life and in where God has planted you, He's wanting you to live out a life of calling with what you've been given. It's taken me a long time to land at this, but I've sort of landed at this. I've got to learn and we've got to learn to be grateful where we are, not always strategizing for where we wish we were. But just to stop and go, this is where I've been planted. This is where God has planted me and my family How can I live out my calling where God has planted me? So your life is a story in which you're not the author, the character, or the main character. To discern the call of God in your life requires a daily encounter with Christ in the midst of that relationship learning. God, what is it you have for me? And then lastly, that our calling is not a future event, but it's now. How do we live out his calling now? And here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to grab a journal. I want you to get alone. And I want you to write down, what have I been given? And just write down everything you've been given. Everything that you've been given by God. Everything that you're a part of and where God has placed you and where God has planted you. And then I want you to write underneath that, what desires has God placed on your soul? What is it you think about? What is it you dream about? What is that deep down desire of calling and purpose that's inside of you? And listen, if you don't know, I want you to do this. I just want you to simply ask God this week and go, God, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my calling is. I don't even know what that looks like. For some of you that don't know Christ at all, maybe your first step is, I wanna give my life to you. I wanna step into my true purpose. And so God, in this moment, you can have my life. Jesus, I simply place my trust and my faith in you. But if you do know, if you do find yourself writing in that journal over and over again and it begins to spill out on the page, then after that's done, I want you to then look down at that journal, all of those words you've written, and I want you to begin to pray, okay, God, now what's my first step? Because he's a God who loves you. And trust me, I've done this over my entire life. He'll call to you and he'll call you to something. And sometimes it's frightening and uncomfortable, but he'll give you this next step and you take it. (laughs) Then he'll give you the next step and you take it. He'll give you the next step and you'll take it because your calling is a process of trusting him for the rest of your days. Let's pray. God, thank you for the calling on our law family. For those that are watching right now, I do pray that deep down in in, in their heart that they would begin to wrestle with, oh God, what is my purpose? What have you called me to? But speak the truth of what Paul knew knew over their lives right now. That number one, that God, you have formed each person watching and listening You formed them by hand. And number two, that you desire to encounter them, to meet with them, that out of relationship, or as Josh taught last week, out of knowing that your son or daughter of God, out of that relationship would come you living into with Christ, with God, purpose. And then lastly, God, Would you give us assignments, specific assignments that we each have been called to do, that we don't live other people's assignments, but we live the assignment you've given us, that we live uniquely what you've called us to. 
And I pray that we as a loft community would be a room full, a church full of believers that are living out the assignment that God has placed on our hearts. Would you do that? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.